Start now. Hooray! Sorry for the delay. Hello, welcome to the RoboJackets Mechanical Workshop. Now we kick off. Um, hopefully, you're here to learn about some mechanical things. I'm Zach. I'm a second year CS major. I'm in BattleBots, which is part of RoboJackets. Um, we'll have QA at the end. You can ask us about mechanical stuff or about college or RoboJackets or whatever. So, we're going to get started. Uh, the first. Wait, hello? Why is it not going? The mouse, I just want to go. Hello, I thought we were free. Why? Why have I been cursed? Okay, really? Oh. There we go. Alright. We're going to start with materials. So, um, materials, obviously, what you use to build your robot. Uh, first, aluminum. The most common. Most of your robot will be made of aluminum. Um, there's a few common alloys of aluminum. Alloys aren't super important when you're dealing with robots. Um, most robotic parts, stuff you get from like Andy Mark, stuff you machine out of stock metal, almost all of it will be 6061, which is a tough alloy, but a little bit cheaper. 7075 is another, another aluminum alloy. It's a bit more expensive, but a bit tougher. If you are having a, a part that's not durable enough, a part that you can't could uh, stand to be a bit stronger, be, and you have a little bit of extra money to spend, you might consider buying some 7075, but for the most part, 6061 gets the job done. Um, aluminum is uh, fairly, it's, it's not super strong, so if you have a thin piece, perhaps eighth of an inch thick, you can sometimes bend it by hand or with a, uh, like a grip, like a vice grip on a bench, and you can use that to bend parts into shape, or um, uh, most like strong uh, uprights and things are made of uh, 8th inch or 16th inch aluminum tubing. So rookie teams this year received some long lengths of uh, aluminum tubing. That's a common part to use. Also, all the parts in the KOP chassis that are a part of like the actual frame are made of aluminum as well. Um, some of the cons that come with aluminum compared to steel, which is the next one, it's very difficult to weld aluminum. It's very dangerous. You need to have some specialized equipment and training. So if you want to weld parts of your robot, you need to use steel instead, even though steel is a bit more expensive and a bit heavier. So, move on. Steel. There's a lot of steel alloys. Steel is a very old material. There's lots. You can read about steel if you want. Um, the big thing to know about steel is that it's very strong and very heavy. So if you want steel on your robot, you need to keep weight considerations in mind. Um, sometimes it might be a good idea to um, add, a, have some steel ballast. If your robot's underweight and you are trying to play some defense, you want to be as close to the weight limit as possible because a heavier robot can withstand and push other robots easier. So, for example, I've seen uh, teams bring big steel plates to put on other robots to make them heavier and make them better defense spots. So steel is very good as a heavy material, but uh, often the extra strength you get from steel is not always worth it just because of the extra weight it brings. And frequently you want to save weight on your robot rather than add it. It's also a bit more expensive. Uh, next, uh, plastics and polycarb, also commonly known as Lexan. Uh, this is a much more a much more lightweight material, and it's frequently used for things that are um, unlikely to, to face a lot of stress during the match, or um, that are more easily transferable. A lot of teams use these for like electrical boards, where they'll get a big piece of polycarb, they'll mark out holes for all their electrical parts, they'll drill some holes, stick it on, and stick it on their remote. Uh, you can buy polycarb or Lexan in a number of different sizes. You drill it, you can, you know, jigsaw, you can do lots of things. It's a very versatile material. 
but it's not super durable, and it's uh, not great to use for parts that are going to be taking a lot of damage unless you have a lot of replacements for them. So uh, the big thing about polycarb is it's easy to work with and very light. Okay. Any questions about materials? I went a little bit fast, but those are just those are the three main ones. Uh, there's maybe other things you'll encounter, but pretty much always it'll be aluminum, steel, or polycarb. All right. Assuming no questions, I'm going to go on to shop tools and manufacturing. This is going to be a few tools that are commonly used to make robots. Not all teams have access to all these tools. That's not a problem. This is just some of the most common ones and what you use them for. Um, first, the drill. The, every robot is like right-hand man. The drill, it makes holes. Uh, the, obviously, when you, you are attaching, building your robot, you attach things frequently with bolts, and bolts have to go through holes. So oftentimes, we use the drill to, you know, arrange your robot in such a way where you can assemble it with bolts and nuts. Um, proper drill usage is important. We're not here to train you on how to use a drill. Hopefully you have some order members or mentors who can give you um, a lot of good training on these tools. But uh, oftentimes you need to use your drill to make holes that don't need to be super precise, but need to be in hard to reach areas, or um, it doesn't really matter if the hole is slightly off center or a little bit at an angle, because obviously since it's handheld, it's not, it, there's a lot of human error potentially involved. Um, Additionally, a common technique or tactic or technique that you might have seen is your robot's really heavy and you think, I need to make my robot not heavy. So you drill lots of holes in things made of metal so that there's less metal there. Uh, you would use a drill for this tool or for this task, you know, maybe holes in your robot to reduce weight. This technique is sometimes called Swiss cheese because you're making holes in your robot. Next is a Dremel. It's a small handheld saw. Uh, you put a uh, grind ring or a grinding tool on the end of this. There's a lot of different types they can use for different things. Um, frequently they're used to cut uh, shafts off or sometimes to um, like sand the end of rods. Mostly it's for cutting. So if you have a piece of metal like the bolt head or a shaft that you need to cut um, and it's already on your robot or it's in a hard to reach place, using a Dremel is usually a good idea. Um, also sometimes you use to cut polycarb, but that's the drum work is often used when you just don't have the right tool for the job, so you need to use something that's not quite right. But the Dremel will cut through a lot of things, so it's very helpful when you have, you know, some issues that you need to resolve. Next is the jigsaw. This is a handheld saw. Uh, it's very useful for cutting complex shapes into sheets of material, frequently polycarb. So if you have a big sheet of polycarb and you think, I need, like, this weird H shape, or like an A, or the mount for my shooter. You draw some lines, and then you follow it with a jigsaw. Um, the jigsaw doesn't cut super great lines because it's handheld, can move around a little bit, but if you use it right with a well-clamped material, you can, do, you can do a good job and cut uh, a very usefully shaped piece of polycarb, sometimes aluminum, and, or often wood as well, and you'll end up with a useful part. Um, now we have some of the more stationary tools, like the larger shop tools. Not all teams have these, that's not a big deal. We're just gonna go over them and explain what they're useful for. Um, the drill press is a stationary, heavy duty drill. Um, it's useful when you need to be a bit more precise with your hole cutting because it's not gonna move around as much. It's always gonna go straight down. Some drill presses have like a laser alignment to show you exactly where your hole's gonna go. So uh, using a drill press effectively is important to building a durable robot because when all your holes line up, your robot is just less likely to break. So if you have access to a drill press, it's very important to line up your holes in the right way, make sure everything's measured properly, and then use the drill press to make sure your hole's in the right spot. Next is the bandsaw. There's two varieties. This is a very versatile tool and very, very useful. Um, on the right here, there's a vertical bandsaw, and on the left, there's a horizontal bandsaw. The uh, primary purpose of, of the bandsaw is cutting through metal, primarily aluminum. So if you have your aluminum tubing, like some teams may have gotten in the KLP, uh, you can run it through the bandsaw to cut it to, to length. You can even sometimes cut it at an angle if you have proper measurements. Um, you can also sometimes cut more complex shapes using the vertical bandsaw, but you have to keep in mind some of the space limitations because as you can see, there's not that much space between the edge of the machine and the blade, and it varies by machine. Um, use most of the parts on your robot will 
probably be cut using the bandsaw. So if you have a custom chassis or you have you know, parts sticking up or a mechanism that is mounted to your robot, very likely most of the parts for that will be cut using the bandsaw, if you have one. Um, and finally, the water jet. Now, most teams do not have a water jet. However, there is a water jet available to most Georgia teams, or all Georgia teams, at KSU. So the water jet allows, to, allows for very precise cutting of sheet aluminum. So you send it a CAD file, and then they put the aluminum in, aluminum in, and it goes and cuts a very complex shape very precisely. So this is extremely valuable for making really good robots because it does it way better than any human person. So example parts that are made of aluminum that are cut using the water jet are like boiler plates for your robot. A big plate you put on the bottom that sort of holds your whole robot together. Lots of holes to mount things, you know, very structurally safe and will make a very durable robot. A common technique is to cut a um, complex like outer face that's like an eighth of an inch thick and then sandwich that around a piece of aluminum tubing. So a single piece of eighth inch aluminum uh, by itself might not be super durable, but if you put other supporting material between multiple parts, then it will do a good job of uh, supporting your robot. Um, an important thing to keep in mind with the water jet is the limitations of the water jet. It can't cut um, 3D geometry. It only will cut a 2D surface through a certain thickness of material. So if you have any overhangs or pockets or things like that, it, the water jet isn't a tool for that. You might want to cut it and then you do another pass with another tool in order to uh, finalize your part. But it's often uh, useful to design your robot in such a way where it lends itself well to using the water jet so you don't have to do extra work. You can just ship off your parts and come back with a nice set of 2D water jet parts. Um, and that's all for shop and materials. Any questions on those? That was a lot of information. Hopefully you'll get trained on some of these tools by your team, but I just wanted to give you guys like a quick overview of what they're all useful for. Any questions? Hi guys, um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about drag trains. So this is how your robot moves around, and we're going to go over the different kinds of common ones um, that teams will often use. So the first one we have here is a West Coast drag, um, and this is the most common variety of drag train, which is included in your like broken kind of parts by Andymar. Uh, what makes it a West Coast drag is that there are three wheels on each side, so six wheels, and then two motors on each side. Oftentimes, these West Coast drives will have the center wheel dropped, um, maybe like a, a, like an eighth of an inch or a quarter inch. And based on the drop of the center wheel, your robot can traverse the obstacles more easily. Um, so at any given time, there will be four wheels on the ground, which makes it uh, able to traverse over obstacles. But the more you drop it, um, the less stable your robot will become. So the pros of this is that it's easier to assemble and it's easy to drive, so you can just use tank steering with your joystick, so like one joystick for the left side and one joystick for the right side. Um, it's easy to program and it also has a strong defense, uh, but it also, uh, for the cons, it has low versatility, which means, um, and it doesn't have non-lateral movement, which it means it doesn't move side to side, which some of the other later drive trains will do. Um, we have a couple of example videos, so I'll just play this one, and you guys can see an example of the West Coast Drive. Just do that. So you can see on this that they have um, six wheels on either side and then one uh, gearbox driving each of them. And each gearbox will have two motors, sorry. Two or three. Two or three, yeah. Um, the next one we'll have is the Mechanum Drive, which it says that it's the most common holonomic drivetrain. Holonomic means it'll just move in um, any direction, any lateral direction. Um, the way that these work is that they have 45 degree rollers on the wheel, like you can see there. 
and they're arranged in kind of an X shape on the robot so that when you power the wheels independently, you can move in any direction around the field laterally. Uh, the pros of this is that it allows for lateral movement and it's not too difficult to program. But the, con the cons is that it doesn't have a lot of pushing power, so it's very susceptible to defense. And it also requires direct control of all, all four wheels. So say like one wheel goes down, then you're kind of um, left with limited mobility on the field. Um, so here's an example of one. So that's it going side to side. You can kind of see how um, the wheels move in different directions for it to produce a wide variety of uh, things. Oh, that's right there. Okay. Um, the next one we have is the H-Drive, or the slide drive. This is not a super common drivetrain, but it's also a holonomic drivetrain. It has omni wheels, which also have rollers, like the mechanical wheels, but they're not 45 degree angles. They're just on the wheels, like you can see over there. So there's four wheels, um, like regularly placed on the robot, and then there's one wheel on the center placed perpendicularly, so it allows for lateral movement. So the pros are that is that it's easy to assemble comparatively, and it's also a simpler holonomic solution as compared to the mechanical wheels. But the cons are is that it's very susceptible to defense because you've um, not got a lot of lateral power because you've only got one wheel going side to side. And it's also kind of slower because, like I said, um, you've only got one wheel going side to side. So here's uh, the 2019 range of shots. You can kind of see there's a lot of lateral movement going on, um, and it, you don't have to turn to a certain position to go in a direction. Okay, I have switched slides. All right, so the final one is um, the swerve drag train. I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard of this, but this is what you would call like the holy grail of drag cranes. And how it works is that there are four of these kind of complicated looking assemblies on each of the four corners. So you have four wheel assemblies, and each of them are powered in two degrees of freedom. So they'll be able to rotate around kind of that axis and also spin the wheel. So if you've ever seen those like utility carts that you move around, it's kind of like that, but just powered. Um, the pros of this is that there's strong mobility, so you can move in all uh, lateral directions, and it's not susceptible, super susceptible to defensive like the other um, holonomic drag trains because it's got strong commuting power, but it's very expensive. Uh, these uh, individual modules uh, are like a couple hundred dollars each, and like as you can see, if you need four of them, the money kind of adds up. And it's also much more challenging to program as compared to the holonomic drag trains, uh, the other ones, the mechanical and the H drive, because uh, this requires, uh, like, uh, the, this requires just uh, much more like uh, knowledge of how to program them, um, and it's also like very high maintenance. You can see there's like a lot of gears and pulleys required. So if something breaks, then um, in a, in the middle of a match, you're kind of stuck maintaining it. But when done well, um, you can move around the field and you can do all these kinds of cool spins and lateral movements. You can kind of see in the video here. That's it spinning around each wheel, which it's able to do because each of the wheels um, are powered individually. All right, that's it for the drag trains. Oh, actually, we have questions. Um, so a lot of you guys are new, but our question is, which drag train was the most common in the 2019 Einstein finals? More of a trivia question than like an actual yeah. question. Yeah, so we'll just take a guess, I guess. So who has a guess? 
Anybody? Yeah. West Coast. Uh, let's see. Yes, it is indeed a West Coast drive. Good job. Okay, next is elevators. Hey, hi everyone, um, I'm William. Uh, I was uh, originally a FRC team captain, so I have some experience making elevators. I participated in 2018 and 2019, so that would be Power Up and what? Deep Space. So we most of the teams use elevators in those games. So I'd like to share some of my experience, some of my knowledge on elevators with you guys. Okay, so, yeah. We just call it elevator because that's the most common type um, of, the, of all other types of elevators. So, yeah, it's mostly driven by strings and pulleys. So, in the next slide, I'll talk about two different ways where how you can arrange those strings and pulleys, but yeah. Um, so some team will use chain for the first stage. Yeah, I'll talk about that later too. Um, it's normally a two stage, could be a three stage. If you want to use a three stage, it will be a more complicated mechanism. Um, and a three stage, the pros would be, it could be faster, but yeah, it, it could be heavier compared to a two-stage elevator. Um, so in the middle part of here, you can see that um, mostly uh, we call it carrier because it normally carries the grabber or the actuator where we um, hold the game piece and lift it up to some certain height so we can score. And in some cases, uh, elevators need to vary the weight of the robot that would be climbing. So, like in um, 2018 and 2000, yeah, 2018, we have a rod uh, that is about six feet high. So, uh, you got to use an elevator. I mean, some of the, most of the teams use the elevator to um, do climbing, not only for themselves but also to take their teammates, robots, um, also do the climbing to score in the last 30 seconds. So this is really powerful. Yeah. So yeah, it's starting to get a little bit technical. Um, so these two ways for strings and pulleys, one on the left side would be continuous, on the right side would be cascade. So, does anyone know what's the difference between those two and the pros and cons? Oh, no, okay. I guess I'll have to explain them. So, we're continuous, like, like the word itself, it, that means you're continuously chaining all of the strings through uh, the pulleys. Um, yeah, it's pretty obvious. So that would be your motor, um, or the gearbox. So normally an elevator will need two to three motors. Um, it depends if you want to lift, how, how heavy is the game piece you want to lift, or you want to lift, lift the robot itself, then you would probably need three motors and a gearbox with a super high gear ratio. And yeah, this would be continuous, so it kind of chain up and down throughout all the stages. Um, so yeah, an example of this would be a three-stage elevator. And on the right side, that we cascade, that means it, the, there are separate strings that only chain between um, the adjacent stages. So like only between the first stage and the second stage, second stage with the third stage, and the third stage with the carrier. So, um, I would say the cascade way would be faster, 
um, because if you see, you only need um, to pull pull the string in the length of in the height of a single stage elevator. But this one, you have to put like a triple or a double of the length that you would need to to pull for the cascade way. Um, one thing you have you like to notice right here is the yellow string down below. That would be the one to pull it down. So you can't always rely on gravity because sometimes if, they, if you haven't do your elevator perfectly, there's some friction in the mechanism or something just go wrong, it'll get stuck up there. And that's what you don't really want during the competition. So. If you're going to do an elevator, probably not for this year's game. But yeah, if you ever want to do an elevator, make sure you have a rope or a string that can pull the carrier down. Um, yeah, like I said, the cascade could be faster. Um, I don't know if you have seen the robot from 148. In 2008, they used a three-stage elevator and used a cascade, cascade um, way to arrange the strings of pulleys, and they're super fast in lifting the queue. So yeah, then I'm going to show two of the videos I found. So yeah, the question would be for you guys: would be which method is used in the form of videos? Is this if they are using the Continuous way or the cascade way? Okay, can anyone tell me which way is 1619 using in this robot? Oh, how can I go to the previous slide? You can show the other one and then. Show the other one? Show the other one so we can compare. Okay. Now, this is the robot from Robot Notch, the third one. Previous video. Video that's showing their elevator. Anyone have any idea or any guesses? Please. It looks like the 1619 team had continuous and the other team had the cascade. Uh, so you're saying uh, 1619 is using the continuous one and the Robonaut is using cascade, right? Cool. Anyone have different? Any Opposite ideas? No? Okay, I, I, I should have explained it in the first place. So, um, the if you're using the continuous way, uh, the carrier would go up first if you start pulling the strings. It's because the carrier would have a lighter weight. And then once the, uh, the carrier reaches the top of the first stage, and the first stage in the carrier as a entity would go up together. So that's what's different from cascade. If you're using a cascade, all the stages go up together at the same time. That's the difference. So actually, um, 16, 19 is using the cascade way. So let's see this. See, yeah, it's right, right here. See, so the 
first stage of the elevator and its carrier is going up at the same time. So that, which means they're using a cascade way of um, arranged strings and pulleys. Um, I would say, yeah, this one could be faster, but, but it might not be as efficient if you want to, like, only a small range of motions, maybe only one or two feet tall is um, how, where you want your game piece to be. That, in that case, a continuous way would be better, like this one. So Rebel Knots is using a continuous way of very strange and poor. Yes, so like you see right here, only the carrier is going up, but not the elevator, like the, the inner frame of the elevator itself. So that's the difference. Yeah, you can pick either one, but um, I would say the cascade way would be more straightforward and more easy to implement. And if you're using chain and sprocket for the first stage, which some of you might use um, because they want to climb or, some, or something like that, that would be cascade because if it, it can be a continuous string, then the first stage, uh, between the first and second stage will be replaced by chain and sprocket. That's all for the first type of elevator. So now we go to multi-segment. So this one and the, the other one, which is this lift that I'm going to talk about, I don't think they're um, as good as an uh, elevator in terms of um, just lifting things. But yeah, they're good options sometimes. Uh, depends on um, the game, um, which year it is. So yeah, it is a good option for elevating a certain kind of game pieces. Um, but yeah, it's not ideal for lifting the robot because it can't bear um, a very, a very um, heavy things. And yeah, the biggest problem about using a multi-segment arm would be it may follow a strain profile when you want to extend, um, like you see right here, because it's a rotary motion, so it doesn't, so if it's a validator, it's a linear motion, you just go up and go down. But it's, if it's a rotary motion, it kind of extends first and then it comes back into the vertical position. So it's kind of hard to predict where um, the, your grabber or your, the game piece would eventually be after um, a series of motions. So either you have a uh, autonomous button like set. Okay, when I press this button, it will the the motor will bring it up to this exact position. Otherwise, if you're controlling it by by hand or by the controller, um, then it would it would be difficult. So yeah, it, it sometimes the arm like a rotary motion would be useful if you want to flip it to the back side of the robot, like many teams do, like Cheesy Proofs 254 they did in 2018, that's how they get, how they win all the games, <laughs> to flip the game piece to the back side and they can shoot the cubes onto the platform. So, so I'm not saying the elevator itself could, would be only options, but you can use a combination of elevator and this kind of a rotary arm. Yeah, and it occupies a lot more space. As you can see in this picture, this, this is going to take up most of the space inside the robot. So we all know you have a certain um, a starting frame which your robot, all the modules have to fit in. So if you're using a multi-second arm, it's going to be very bulky. Um, difficult to maintain, yeah, that would be the same problem which um, scissor lift have. So it might, it might, something might go wrong and you're not able to fix it 
before the next game when you're actually in the competition. So that's something you have to consider when you're doing the robot design. Yeah, so these two are, oh, the first one would be a very good example of how to use a robot technique. Yeah, so you can, so what you can see, So what you can see right here in this video is they have another mechanism on the back side of the robot, which is for climbing. So my point here is the, the multi-segment arm is not going to be able to lift the entire robot up, up um, to score the point, but they have another mechanism um, for the end the last 30 seconds. And yeah, that would be a two second arm, I, I guess. So the major one, and there's one um, on the grabber so they can flip the game piece either on the front side or on the back side. That'd be great, but maybe not for this year. Cool. Yeah, that, this would be another video. They use a really simple elevator also to account for some higher positions, but yeah, they also use the multi-second arm for the 2018 game. Okay. okay. The last one, scissor lift. Have anyone tried make, to make a scissor lift before? Anyone? No? Oh, and uh, you want to share some of the experience you have making the scissor lift? Yeah, for these things, it's, it's difficult to get it right because it relies upon the angles being correct and the motivating force. But if you can make it work, almost almost work that work with uh, the lifts you see in stages and erupting stuff uh, in buildings are based on a scissor lift. It's just it's a very good way to keep something compact and get a lift, but. It is difficult to get it right. Yeah, thank you. So, um, yeah, it's it's very difficult. So I haven't tried my, this myself, but I've seen some of the team in some regional events doing this, and it doesn't work really well. So, but it could be a challenge if you want to try. Um, maybe not during the build season. Maybe when you're doing some mechanical training or some practices, then you can build, try to build this. Um, yep, very efficient motion, cannot support weight, very difficult to maintain. So that's the main issue with scissor lift. It's not responding. <laughs> okay, here's the question. <laughs> well, who do you think you need elevators for this year's game? One, two, three, four, five. Oh, no. oh. Who think you don't need elevators? No one? Okay, it's hard to say, um, but so, go yeah, on. you got it. <laughs> so, but those. We think you need elevators. Can you try to explain in which part, like for scoring the balls or for climbing? Like, where do you need the elevators? Please go ahead. Yeah, like you said, you definitely need them for the climbing. But for scoring the balls, maybe not, you wouldn't have to elevate like all the way, but you definitely need some sort of elevator to put the ball in the 
Yeah, that's the same thing what I'm thinking. If you're only aiming for the lower, lower, lower one for scoring a bowl, then maybe a, an elevator could help. But if it is a higher one, I think the higher one would be like seven or eight feet high. Then I don't think a, a the elevator in this season would be allowed to reach that certain high. So you can't reach the higher one, the higher hub with an elevator. It goes too far. So, right. so what about for climbing? Anyone have any idea how we can use the elevator in climbing? No? Oh, please. I don't know how we'd swing, but at least you could grab onto one of the bars that you probably Yeah. So right now I have no I I don't have any um idea for how to swing to the last one, but at least for the second or the first one, you can try to find some videos from 2018 part up that would be very similar uh, at least you can score like at least six, six points I don't know at least some points for the end game um, so yeah I think maybe this type of elevator but you can make you can make a um, simpler version of this maybe just one rod next to the other and use some kind of string and pulleys to put it up. You can use also use a hook. You can just put a hook up on the rod, and then the string or the rope and the motor gearbox would do the rest of the work. That could be a good option. No one using the arm or the scissor lift. Don't do so. I'm yeah. receiving lift this year. <laughs> I see these scissor lifts, I'll be sad. Cool, that's all from me. Don't forget to introduce yourself. So, Gregor is in Oh! Oh, hello, I'm Gray. <laughs> and I'm going to present grammars and actuators to you. So, basically, wheels can be used in virtually every part of the robot because. Seriously, you can use them to as grabbers, you can use them for the intake, you could use them to like try to make something. How do I explain this? Sorting balls and fixing balls. Yeah. You could use it to whack stuff too. Like just like more direct. Like just like to kind of make it so that if you're using aluminum, like the aluminum is not taking damage or something. So wheels, uh, typically you would be, you would probably see them in the drive chain and stuff like this, but this is over here for the gears, so you're taking essentially rotational motion and turning it into linear motion. Uh, this would be something that's more concentrated within your actual machinery, so like if you were to have something that's like climbing, you would probably have like a rapid pinion. So like you'd have like a motor that's actually turning it up, so like actually moving uh, forward, so yes. Uh, it's mostly, it's usually steel though, so it's just sort of like, this is one of those things that you wouldn't normally use unless you're okay with uh, not having to lift said piece. Because if that were the case, then that would be a consideration to take into mind. Also, if speed is an issue, probably don't use this. And then this is also used, uh, springs instead are used for like shock absorbers. So like maybe you'll have like a, a pneumatic actuator. And what will happen is like as a shock absorber, just to make sure that it doesn't like crash back into it, you would have like a spring. Uh, you wouldn't normally make that, but it's just like an idea. You would use it for compression to like make sure that it's not going to like shift too much. Like maybe you would have it in your bot to make sure that nothing moves around too much because the general idea is to put things in equilibrium. So it's more or less to make sure that you're not going to have things just like sliding around. Like you could easily just like tie it down or like bolt it, but this is also another idea. And then for the pneumatics, 
Uh, what we have here is that this is a pneumatic actuator, and typically you would probably have like something attached, or like it, you would use it as kind of like a way to kind of shoot. And that's that's going into shooters, but it's just like the general idea is that you use air pressure to essentially make like a kinetic motion, which you can see in this diagram here. So the compressor has like a certain amount of air typically, and then you would like have your air tanks, and then over here you would have your switch that would actually allow it to shoot out, and then the solenoid will pull, retract it back in. So if you had like maybe this in conjunction to another part, you would make sure you would tie it to this. The only consideration is making sure that you have it secured. Oh, sorry. Hush. Okay, sorry. So it's always very important to know what your parts can and can't do and like the limitations of them because if you were to start making something without considering whether or not it would hold, uh, it would be rather unfortunate if it were to fail. But all of the parts I've gone over so far are parts that are kind of easy to notice when they're not working well. Are there any questions or comments on what I've gone over? Like, was it clear at all? Just something with rack and pinion. Uh, you can 3D print those. We had a rack and pinion system for our hood last year. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can like look up how to uh, 3D like CAD them, and you can 3D print them out of a, a nice hard plastic, and it worked pretty well. So it's really durable. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily have to be metal. Oh, sorry. Go on. It doesn't necessarily have to be metal. Yeah, that's that's very true. But also, like when you three D print things, like if it's slightly off, and these like require like a certain level of precision, that it could like deteriorate faster than you would want it to. Works all the time. Oh, sweet! <laughs> what type of material do you use? I don't remember. It was purple. <laughs> <laughs> the color royalty. Shooters. So I did FRC during I'm Nithya. I'm a first year CS major. Uh, I was part of the FRC team in 2020 and 2021. So we use shooters a lot. Uh, okay. So there's three different types of shooters that you can use. Uh, the first type is a stationary shooter. So this is the most common variety. It's the easiest to build. Uh, you don't have to put in too much maintenance and work into it. Uh, the limitation, obviously, is that you have to be the exact same radius from the goal every time in order to shoot. So, yeah, you can't shoot from anywhere on the field. So it, it'll take more time to get stuff done. Uh, you might not always be able to get to a position that you can shoot in, so those are some limit, limitations of stationers. Uh, here's a video. So if you look at the computer, uh, there's no hood or uh, any movement. They're the same radius from the goal in order to shoot. Here's the adjustable hood. Uh, we, my team used an adjustable hood 2021. Uh, for this, you can adjust the radius that you shoot at because you have different angles that the ball kind of like launches off of. Uh, so, increased available shooting locations, you can shoot from, uh, you can shoot really close. So, uh, in 2020 and 2021, we had like the really high up goal, the hexagon, and it could shoot pretty close to the goal. There weren't any limitations with that. Uh, the cons are both more difficult to program, more difficult to tune. Uh, there's more variables involved as to like the angles and you gotta do math stuff <laughs> to figure it out. Uh, so this is an improvement on the stationary shooter because it gives you a lot more options and makes your robot more versatile. I have a video here. So uh, as you can see, the shooter is adjustable so you can change the angle at which you shoot. Uh, the last type of shooter is a turreted shooter. So apart from, uh, it can be adjustable, it can uh, turn. So you have more degrees of freedom. 
And this is, this makes your robot really, really versatile. You can shoot from a lot of different locations. You don't have to waste time turning your entire robot to shoot. Uh, you have a lot more options. Uh, naturally, as you get more complicated shooters, you have more variables, and maintenance becomes harder. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Here's an example. So you can see the turret. The entire shooter can turn, saving time from the robot having to turn every time you shoot. So, yeah. All right. Any questions? All the content we have, so you guys can ask us any questions about any mechanical stuff, stuff we didn't cover, stuff we did. The LRI for Georgia is in the back there. Say hi. You can ask him questions too. He's very knowledgeable. Um, or you can just ask us questions not having to do with mechanical FRC stuff. You know, we're college students. If you're curious about that, you can ask us that too. Um, otherwise, we're done. So, you know, thanks everybody. Thanks for coming. Hope you learned something and uh, good luck with your season. Thank you. So lonely now. Oh, one question. Um, I was wondering. So, like, if there's gonna be like an elevator, like raising it, I think it would make it more unstable and stuff. So, is the unstableness different for like each type of elevator that you can use? Uh, for like the linear elevator and the arm thing, it's just as good. So, if you want stability, then just pick the first one, the most common type of elevator. Yeah, and if you can learn a lot from YouTube videos. If it's properly constrained, it ideally won't be able to move back and forth pretty right. much, which is a big source of instability. Because if you have it it's really tall and it like can slide around, it might be kind of wobbly. But if you have like very minimal spacing in the middle part so that it slides perfectly as rail, it will move. Then it will just stay. Compared to, yeah, yeah you this is a really good CAD model I found online for editor. So you can see they have like some modules right here, like a, the slide do, that's you, how you constrain the motion only up and down, but not going sideways. So, the thing that the turret shooter, well, the first part, because your turret is, Around the right. might not always be in the same spot, so you need to have a way of aiming them. Most games have a way of around the way that you track software. But you have to, your software has to know exactly where the turret is and how the shooting for that action. So this is also probably just fluid, but when you're further away or closer, in addition to changing the angle, you might also need to change the spinning so in order to get it on the right part of the field. So, um, you can solve this by doing math or doing your test for the computer. This is a process that a lot of teams end up not having time on. So, we just don't work great, even though you have a really good mechanism for it. So, we didn't have enough time to make sure that the deep five was not like narrowing down exactly like where we can shoot, how much power. And when you have more variables like angle, or good angle, or power, then it makes it a little bit more complicated. That's going to be a so, I mean, we may see like a stationary shooter is like a shooter. Yeah, right. So 
Uh, the easier way to explain it is you can use a very long numerical distance. So, yeah, there is zero one. So, if it's zero, it stays